Hey everybody, Miss Allen here. We're going to keep reading The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis, the first book in the Chronicles of Narnia series. Now, to rewind that a little bit, this is the first book in the series, but turns out he didn't actually write it first. He wrote some of the other stories first and then realized he wanted to make a origin, a beginning story. So he put it first in the order to read it, but it doesn't really matter what order you read that series. That's something cool about it. Anyways, we left off chapter 9. It was the founding of Narnia, so the land that Diggory and Polly and Jadis and Uncle Andrew and the cab driver and his horse all ended up in this blank, desolate land. There was, there, there was no light, there was no anything, and all of a sudden it started to grow. It was, the land was being born. And this lion was singing it into existence. And he heard, we heard the lion call the land Narnia. And that's what happened in chapter 9. So in chapter 10, we're going to read. We will see what happens there. It's called The First Joke and Other Matters. It was, of course, the lion's voice. The children had long felt sure that he could speak, yet it was lovely and terrible shock when he did. Out of the trees, wild people stepped forth, gods and goddesses of the wood. With them came fawns and satyrs and dwarves. Out of the river rose the river god with his naiad daughters. And all these, and all the beasts and birds in their different voices, low or high, or thick or clear, replied. So all these animals and stuff are just about to talk. Hail Aslan, we hear and obey. We are awake. We love, we think, we speak, we know. But please, we don't know very much yet, said a nosy and snorty kind of voice. And that really did make the children jump, for it was the cab horse who had spoken. So the horse that they brought with them now can talk. Good old Strawberry, said Polly. I am glad he was one of those picked out to be a talking beast. And the cabbie, who was now standing beside the children, said, Strike me pink. I always did say that us had a lot of sense, though. Creatures, I give you yourselves, said the strong, happy voice of Aslan. I give to you forever the land of Narnia. I give you the woods, the fruits, the rivers. I give you the stars, and I give you myself. The dumb beasts, whom I have not chosen, are yours also. Treat them gently and cherish them but do not go back to their ways, lest you cease to be talking beasts yourselves. For out of them you were taken, and into them you can return. Do not do so. No, Aslan, we won't, we won't, said everyone. But one perky jackdaw, that's a kind of like a bird, not kind of, it is a bird, added in a loud voice, no fear, and everyone else had finished just before he said it, so that his words came out quite clear in a dead silence. And perhaps you have found out how awful that can be, say, at a party. The jackdaw became so embarrassed that it hid its head under its wing as if it were going to sleep. And all the animals began making various strange noises, which are their ways of laughing, and which, of course, no one has ever heard in our world before. They tried at first to repress it, but Aslan said, Laugh and fear not, creatures. Now that you are no longer dumb and witless, you need, you need not always be grave. Meaning, you don't have to always be serious. For jokes as well as justice come in with speech. So they all let themselves go, and there was such merriment that the jackdaw himself plucked up courage again and perched on the cab horse's head, between its ears, clapping its wings, and said, Aslan, Aslan, have I made the first joke? Will everybody always be told how I made the first joke? No, little friend, said the lion. You have not made the first joke. You have only been the first joke. Then everyone laughed more than ever. But the jackdaw didn't mind, and laughed just as loud till the horse shook its head, and the jackdaw lost its balance and fell off, but remembered its wings. They were still new to it, before it reached the ground. Here's a picture of the, uh, of the fawns, and the naiads and dwarves, and some of the animals. I think that's a bunny, and there's the jackdaw bird there. And now, said Aslan, Narnia is established. We must next take thought for keeping it safe. 
I will call some of you to my council. Come hither to me, you chief dwarf, and you, the river god, and you, oak, and the he owl, and both the ravens and the bull elephant. We must talk together. For though the world is not five hours old, an evil has already entered it. The creatures he had named came forward, and he turned away eastward with them. The others all began talking, saying things like, What did he say had entered the world? A nevil? What's a nevil? No, he didn't say nevil. He said a weevil. Well, what's that? Here are all the creatures that Aslan, Aslan called to his council. The elephant and the birds and the owl and the dwarf and the river god and the oak tree. Look here, said Diggory to Polly. I've got to go after him. Aslan, I mean. The lion. I must speak to him. Do you think we can, said Polly. I wouldn't dare. I've got to, said Diggory. It's about Mother. If anyone could give me something that would do her good, it would be him. I'll come along with you, said the cabbie. I like the look of him, and I don't even reckon these other beasts will go for us, and I want a word with old Strawberry. So all three of them stepped out boldly, or as boldly as they could, toward the assembly of animals. The creatures were so busy talking to one another and making friends that they didn't notice the three humans until they were very close. Nor did they hear Uncle Andrew, who was standing trembling in his buttoned boots a good way off and shouting, but by no means at the top of his voice, Diggory! Diggory! Come back! Come back at once when you're told! I forbid you to go a step further! When at last they were right in among the animals, the animals all stopped talking and stared at them. Well, said the he-beaver at last, what in the name of Aslan are these? Please, began Diggory in a rather breathless voice when a rabbit said, they're a kind of large lettuce, that's my belief. No, we're not, honestly, we're not, said Polly hastily. We're not at all nice to eat. There, said them all, they can talk. Who ever heard of a talking lettuce? Perhaps they're the second joke, suggested the jackdaw. A panther, which had been washing its face, stopped for a moment to say, Well, if they are, they're nothing like so good as the first one. At least I don't see anything very funny about them. And it yawned and went on with its wash. Oh, please, said Diggory. I'm in such a hurry. I want to see the lion. All this time, the cabbie had been trying to catch Strawberry's eye. Now he did. Now, Strawberry, old boy, he said, you know me. You ain't going to stand there and say as you don't know me. What's the thing talking about, horse? said several voices. Well said Strawberry very slowly. I don't exactly know. I think most of us don't know much about anything yet. But I've sort of idea I've seen a thing like this before. I have a feeling I lived somewhere else, or was something else, before Aslan woke us all up a few minutes ago. It's all very muddled, like a dream. But there were things like these three in the dream. What? said the cabbie. Not know me. Me, what used to bring you... A hot mash of an evening when you were out of sorts. Me, who rubbed you down proper. Me, what never forgot to put your cloth on you if you were standing in the cold. I wouldn't have thought it of you, Strawberry. It does begin to come back, said the horse thoughtfully. Yes, let me think now, let me think. Yes, you used to tie a horrid black thing behind me, and then hit me to make me run. And however far I ran, this black thing would always be coming, Rattle, rattle behind me. We add our living to earn, see, said the cabbie. Yours the same as mine. If there hadn't been no work and no whip, there'd have been no stable, no hay, no mash, and no oats. For you did get a taste of oats when I could afford them, which no one can deny. Oats, said the horse, perking up his ears. Yes, I remember something about that. Yes, I remember more and more. You were always sitting up somewhere behind, and I was always running in front pulling you in the black thing. I know I did all the work. Summer, I grant you, said the cabbie. Ought work for you and a cool seat for me. What about winter, old boy, when you was keeping yourself warm and I was sitting up there with my feet like ice and my nose fair pinched off me with the wind and my hands that numb, I couldn't oddly hold the reins. It was a hard, cruel country, said Strawberry. There was no grass and it was all hard stones. Too true, mate, too true, said the cabbie. Now, odd world it was. I always did say those paving stones weren't fair on any hoss. 
That's London, that is. I didn't think I didn't like it more than what you did. You were a country ass, and I was a country man. Used to sing in the choir I did down at home, but there wasn't a living for me there. Oh please, please, said Diggory. Could we get on? The line's getting further and further away, and I do want to speak to him so dreadfully badly. Look here, Strawberry, said the cabbie. This young gentleman has something on his mind that he wants to talk to the lion about. Him you call Aslan. Suppose you was to let him ride on your back? Which he'd take it very kindly, and trot him over to where the lion is. And me and the little girl will be following along. Ride? said Strawberry. Oh, I remember now. That means sitting on my back. I remember there used to be a little one of you two luggers who used to do that long ago. He used to have a, a little hard square lumps of some white stuff that he gave me. That tasted... Oh, wonderful. Sweeter than grass. Ah, that'd be the sugar, said the cabbie. Please, Strawberry, begged Diggory. Do, do let me get up and take me to Aslan. Well, I don't mind, said the horse. Not for once in a way. Up you get. Good old Strawberry, said the cabbie. Here, young'un, I'll give you a lift. And Diggory was soon on Strawberry's back, and quite comfortable, for he had ridden bareback before on his own pony. Now do gee up, Strawberry, he said. You don't happen to have you don't happen to have a bit of that white stuff about, do you, I suppose? said the horse. No, I'm afraid I haven't, said Diggory. Well, it can't be helped, said Strawberry, and off they went. At that moment a large bulldog, who had been sniffing and staring very hard, said Look, isn't there another of these strange creatures over there? Beside the river? Under those trees? Then all the animals looked and saw Uncle Andrew standing very still among the rhododendrons, hoping he wouldn't be noticed. That's kind of flower. Come on, said several voices. Let's go and find out. So, while Strawberry was briskly strotting, briskly trotting away with Diggory in one direction, and Polly and the cabbie were following on foot, most of the creatures rushed toward Uncle Andrew with roars, barks, grunts, and various noises of cheerful interest. We must now go back a bit and explain what the whole scene had looked like from Uncle Andrew's point of view. It had not, it had not, whew, tongue twisted. It had not made at all the same impression on him as on the cabbie and the children. For what you see and hear depends a good deal on where you are standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. Ever since the animals had first appeared, Uncle Andrew had been shrinking further and further back into the thicket. He watched them very hard, of course, but he wasn't really interested in seeing what they were doing, only in seeing whether they were going to make a rush at him. Like the witch, he was dreadfully practical. He simply didn't notice that Aslan was choosing one pair out of every kind of beast. All he saw, or thought he saw, was a lot of dangerous wild animals walking vaguely about, and he kept on wondering why the other animals didn't run away from the big lion. When the great moment came and the beast spoke, he missed the whole point, for a rather interesting reason. When the lion had first begun singing, long ago, when it was still quite dark, he had realized that the noise was a song, and he had disliked the song very much. It made him think and feel things he did not want to think and feel. Then, when the sun rose and he saw that the singer was a lion, only a lion, he said to himself. He tried his hardest to make believe that it wasn't singing and never had been singing, only roaring as any lion might in a zoo in our own world do. Of course, it can't really be singing, he thought. I must have imagined it. I've been letting my nerves get out of order. Who ever heard of a lion singing? And the longer and more beautiful the lion sang, the harder, the harder Uncle Andrew tried to make himself believe that he could hear nothing but roaring. Now the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you very often succeed. And Uncle Andrew did. He soon did hear nothing but roaring in Aslan's song. Soon he couldn't have heard anything else, even if he had wanted to. And when at last the lion spoke and said, Narnia, awake, he didn't hear any words. He heard only a snarl. And when the beast spoke in answer, he heard only barkings, growlings, bangings, and howlings. And when they laughed, well, you can imagine how that sounded. That was worse for Uncle Andrew than anything that had happened yet. Such a horrid, bloodthirsty din of hungry and angry brutes he had never heard in his life. Then to his utter rage and horror, he saw the other three humans actually walking out into the open to meet the animals. The fools, he said to himself. Now those brutes will eat the rings along with the children, and I'll never be able to get home again. What a selfish little boy that Diggory is. And the others are just as bad. They want to throw away their own lives. That's their business. But what about me? They don't seem to think of that. No one thinks of me. 
What a poor attitude he's got. Just a sec. Excuse me, Siri. Finally, when a whole crowd of animals came rushing toward him, he turned and ran for his life. And now anyone could see that the air of that young world was really doing the old gentleman good. In London, he had been far too old to run. Now he ran at a speed which, which, would, made, which would have made him certain to win the hundred yards race at any prep school in England. His coattails flying out behind him were a fine sight. But of course it was no use. Many of the animals behind him were the swift ones. It was the first run they had ever taken in their lives, and they were all longing to use their new muscles. After him, after him, they shouted. Perhaps he's that Neville. Tally ho, tend to be, cut him off, round him up, keep it up, hurrah! In a very few minutes, some of them got ahead of him. They lined up in a row and barred his way. Others hemmed him in from behind. Wherever he looked, he saw terrors. Antlers of great elks and the huge face of an elephant towered over him. Heavy, serious-minded bears and boars grunted behind him. Cool-looking leopards and panthers with sarcastic faces, as he thought, stared at him and waved their tails. What struck him most of all was the number of open mouths. The animals had really opened their mouths to pant. He thought they had opened their mouths to eat him. Here's a picture of Uncle Andrew running away from all those animals. And his coattails, whoop, his coattails flapping in the breeze. Uncle Andrew stood trembling and swaying this way and that. He had never liked animals at the best of times, being usually rather afraid of them. And of course, years of doing cruel experiments on animals had made him hate and fear them far more. Now, sir, said the bulldog in his businesslike way, are you animal, vegetable, or mineral? That was what it really said, but all Uncle Andrew heard was growl. And that's the end of chapter 10. Leaving us on a cliffhanger thinking Uncle Andrew might be eaten. I don't think anybody would be too upset if that happened. Uncle Andrew might not even be too upset if that happened. He seems to, like, abandon his senses in times of stress. Uh, tell me what you guys think of how Strawberry was one of the horses that was chosen to talk. The cabbie's horse. And that it couldn't remember London, where it lived its whole life. Very interesting. There was a line in here that I thought was really interesting that I want you all to think about. I was talking about how, from Uncle Andrew's point of view, he didn't hear a good song. He didn't hear the animals talking. He just heard them growling, wanting to eat him. It says, For what you see and hear depends a good deal on where you're standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. So that just makes me think of how you need to see things from other people's perspectives and not jump to conclusions. What someone may see, what someone may do as something kind and nice, you might think that's really rude, but you just have to see where they're coming from. I don't know. Some little words of wisdom in here. Uh, chapter 11 is called Diggory and his uncle are both in trouble. So we'll see how that goes tomorrow or Monday. All right. You guys have a good weekend and I will see you guys on Tuesday.